lay a hold of these. We've been through so much this month. I want you to go back and watch these messages if you haven't, because I can't re-preach them all. But today, you could be exhausted because you don't know you get a day of rest. You get a day of rest. That was the very first week we learned about the Sabbath, that you work six, you rest one. And that means you work six, like you work hard six, so you rest one. It's a cycle that God's created, and you will be rested if you Sabbath. Work six, rest one. Then we learn the next week that God is the God of the first fruits. This is where tithes and offerings come from. This is where praying and fasting comes from, that all the first fruits belong to God. And so when I have him as the God of my life, that means he gets the first fruits of my life. Huge principle that allows us to be rested where profit is concerned. Listen, money wants to run you ragged and leave you empty. But if we handle it correctly, it becomes a tool in our life, not a treasure to our life. And so big stuff on first fruits. And then last week we learned about don't take revenge because it isn't yours. You might be taking something that's not yours and you might be wore out because revenge belongs to the Lord, not you. And if you're taking revenge, you're wore out. Like I said, you gotta go back and watch these. It's the Lord. And we left with this principle, hurting people heal people. Hurting people heal people. That's how we live. We don't take revenge. No, hurting people heal people. And we've learned that all of these principles, along with the one we're gonna learn today, takes trust. And if we don't do them, then we don't trust God. That's the whole thing. It's the, the foundational step in all of these is that I'm gonna have to step out and go, Lord, I'm trusting you because it doesn't make sense all the time. It doesn't look the way everyone else is going. And there's gonna be this bold step for you as a believer to say, God, I trust you. And can I just encourage you today? You can trust him. He is so good. Can I get a witness? He is so good. He is so good. And so here's our series scripture. I'm gonna have, it re have you read it with me because I want you to memorize it. Proverbs chapter three has been our series scripture for the entire series. I'd encourage you to tattoo it on your mirror and get it somewhere you see it every day. Read this with me. One, two, three, go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. That is so good. And we've been learning to trust in the Lord has everything to do with what I lean on. Am I leaning on me or do I lean on him? Where are you leaning? Because if you can lean, you can clean, right? Where are you leaning? I got to lean on the Lord and notice he makes your path straight. Anyone spend too much time on crooked paths? I did. I want straight. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to go straight. I want to go right down the way he's calling me to go. And so this is our first foundational part of how we do this. We got to trust him. So today, you're going to have to trust him in what he's saying. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's get it. Let's get it. How many of you in here would say, I believe that God is a good father? Anyone be able to, be able to say that? I mean, that might be a stretch for some people. Some people hear the word father and it's like, ah! It's not a good word. It's not a comfy word. It's not a, uh, an encouraging word. It's like, yeah, but God's a good father. He's a good father. And there's this place where we've got to believe that he's a good father. He's a good father because here's why. He won't tell you to do something you can't do. He's a good father because he never sets you up for failure. He never puts you in a place to watch you fail. He, he'll never give you an expectation just so that you fail and look dumb. He never does that. He's a good father. Anything he says or encourages you to do is for your success. And he proved it this way. He gave the most for you to succeed. He gave his one and only son just to prove I am all in for you. He pushed all his chips over to say I'm in for you. Are you in for me? He's a good father. And he'll never ask you to do something that you can't do. He'll never give you a command that isn't possible. He's a good God. Here's also why he's good. He's a provider. You know, how, you know why he's a good provider? This is awesome. Because he sees you where you are. He's a good father because he's a provider. And he provides because he knows exactly where you are right now today. 
He knows your situation. He's not a far off God that doesn't know where you are and doesn't see you. He's intimate about your life and he's a good provider because he knows where you are. He knows the situation you're in. He's a good God and he's never gonna tell you to do impossible stuff. And you could be exhausted today by something God the Father, our good Father, is telling you not to do. You could be exhausted today because he's told us not to do something and I would venture to say most of us do it. But if we trust that he's good, if we trust that he's for our good, we can lay a hold of this today and we can take the command and go, okay, Lord, I'm gonna believe you, not me. How do you know that's a big step in life, going, I'm not always right? Anyone in here think they're always right? Okay, got a few that'll admit that. Let's go. I love the authenticity. Oh, come on. I'm that guy. Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at this. If you got a Bible with you, Matthew chapter 6 is a command from a good, good father that he's given you because it's possible. He wouldn't tell you something that's not possible. He doesn't create fairy tale lifestyles for us. He's authentic and as real as you are in this moment. And when he tells us stuff, it's because it's possible. And so here's what he says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. Do not worry about your life. Check this out. What you will eat or drink about your body or what you will wear. That is most people's life right there. Where are we eating? What are we drinking? What am I going to wear? We look in full closets, walk-in closets. And what do we say? I have nothing to wear, right? Don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or what you will wear. This is a command because it's possible. Do not worry. All right, Authentic authenticity time. Got any worries in here today? Worriers, worriers, where are my worriers at? Come on, you got to admit it to get free. You got it. My grandma worried if there wasn't something to worry about. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm just kind of nervous there's nothing to worry about. I should be worrying about something. There's nothing to worry. Do not worry. That is a huge statement. And I say this because some people hear that and go, well, <laughs> that's a cute devotional and all, but it's not realistic. No, it's realistic. It's realistic. God the Father, he's good, he's for you, he knows your situation, and he's saying today, do not worry. Some of you are exhausted by this right here. It wears you out. It's worn you out. It's working on you. Worry because there's nothing to worry about. Worry because there's too much to worry about. And God's telling us to live a life without it. Live a life without it. This is huge. We're going to get some people set free today. Oh, I'm excited. And many times, here's what we do. Many times we live and build a life outside of God's purpose, and therefore we end up worrying and distracted. We build our little castles. We create our little lives outside of the purpose of God, and it's the very thing that creates worry and distraction from what we're building from the thing we're trying to create. And so the goal is to line up with his purpose. Therefore, I'm underneath of his provision so that we don't live worried and we don't live distracted. I like to say it like this. We exist to make heaven bigger and the kingdom of God better. That's why we exist. We exist to pull people out of hell and populate heaven. Does, does that get anyone excited? I'm thankful someone did it for me. I'm thankful someone showed up in my life and said, knock it off. Your life is more important than that. We exist to pull people out of darkness and populate heaven. That's why we're alive. That's why we're breathing, to carry the very presence of God into a dark world and to make the kingdom of God better on the earth where God has full reign to move through his people. That's why we exist. And so when we build outside of that, we end up worried and distraction. Worry comes from two places. Write this down if you're taking notes. If you're not, write this down. Worry comes from two places. Either you don't trust the one who is in control. It comes from not trusting the one who is in control. Or you're worried because you don't have control. Worry comes from two places. I don't trust the one who's in control. Or I don't like the fact that I'm not in control. It creates worry. 
I want to control this. I want to know what the outcome's going to look like. I want to know what's going to happen. I want to know how it's going to look and is it all going to work. Here's my encouragement to you today. Don't build a life so small that you can control it. Let this sink in, church. Let's not build lives so small we can control them. That is nothing but a life full of worry. That's nothing but a life full of what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? How's it going to work? And let me just say it plainly, that's all temporal. Someone said it like this, you succeed at something that doesn't matter. Let's not live lives so small we can control them. Let's be a little bolder than that. Let's, let's be a little more aggressive than that with what God's calling us to do. Let's live lives bigger than what we can control because all this leads to is worry. I like to say it like this, live a life so big that God is in charge of it. Live a life so big that God has to be in charge of it. What would that look like? What would that look like in your situation today? If you were living a life so big, God had to be in charge of it. Where it's like, I gotta push this over. I, there's, there's, no, I can't hand, there's no way I could manage this thing. Live a life so big that God's got to be in charge of it. Does that sound fun to anybody? Listen, we don't serve a boring God, people. <laughs> he is so phenomenal. He is always working. And if we, we can either live lives so small that we control them, or we can live a life so big, so big, that God's got to be in charge of it. I, I like to think of it like this. If my prayers don't come to pass, I'm sunk. Imagine that. Imagine all the plan B's being ripped up and thrown out. And if, if my prayers don't come to pass, I'm sunk. Because I'm living on something way bigger than my little ideas and managements and the buttons and levers that I'm pushing and pulling. I want to live a life way bigger than I can control. Let me show you our command for rest today. This is our command for rest. Every week we've had a command that God's telling us to do so that we'll be rested here it is. Check this out. It's how to live a life way bigger than you. Philippians chapter 4. You ready for this? This is how we live a life way, way, way bigger than us. Verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. This is a command that will give you rest in your life. How many of you pray about everything? How many of you worry about everything? <laughs> Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. What you do with your anythings and everythings determine if you're exhausted or not. What you're doing with your anythings and everythings determine if you're exhausted or if you're rested or if you're strong. Look at the next part of this verse. It says, tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. I would say this is the tension in life right here. If you want the tension in life, it's this. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. Because when you thank him for all that he's done, you realize all that he's done. If all you do is tell him what you need, you turn into a spoiled brat and don't think he's done anything for you. And it's the greatest tension in life. Tell him what you need, thank him for what he's done. I love that because when you're telling him what you need and then you thank him for what he's done, you're gonna believe that he's gonna do what you need because he's already done what you already asked him to do last time. If thank him for what he's done, tell him what you need. It's a tension in life. It's how I don't worry about everything. I pray about everything. It's our command for rest today. This is rest. Pray about everything. Pray about everything. This is rest. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's small enough to worry about, it's small enough to pray about. Is anyone getting this this morning? I feel like we're kind of doing a shift because sometimes we don't even realize how precious prayer is. Sometimes we don't realize what it is and we're linking up to something today that is so for us. Here's my encouragement to you today. Let worry become a trigger. It's time to pray. The Bible says a minute of worry doesn't do anything for your life. One minute of worry doesn't do anything but give you a gray hair. Bink! That's all it does. It doesn't do any, sorry, silverheads. Actually, the Bible calls it wisdom. It's wisdom. My bad. I'm wrong. It says it won't add a minute to your life. It doesn't lengthen the situation. A worry does nothing for you. 
That's what the Bible tells us. If it's small enough to worry about, it's small enough to pray about. Let it be a trigger. When you get that, oh, I better pray. It's worth praying about. It means I gotta pray. I get to pray. Let worry become a trigger. It's time to pray. It's time to pray. I wanna see y'all writing this stuff down. Come on, we're gonna become praying people. Let's go. Worry is this. Worry is looking to yourself to make it work. Worry is looking at yourself to make it work. Prayer is looking to God to work through it. Worry is when I look at myself to say, how am I gonna make this work? How am I gonna make this work? How am I gonna make this work? That's worry. Prayer is saying, God, would you work through this? Would you work in this? Would you move in this situation? Worry or prayer? We wanna be praying people. I wanna show you what Paul talked about. Paul was a church builder, an apostle in the Bible, done phenomenal stuff. Colossians chapter four, verse two, Paul says something so cool about prayer, but also the thing I like about Paul is he's living a life bigger than he can control. The thing about Paul is he's not living a life so small that he can control it. He's living this way bigger perspective, this way bigger life. And he says this to us, devote yourselves. What's the last thing you devoted yourself to? Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind. Here it is again, and a thankful heart. Isn't that interesting how much that comes up? Being thankful, being grateful. Devote yourself to this thing called prayer. Be devoted to it. Be all in. Be all for it with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray about everything. That's what he's saying. Pray about everything. Be in prayer about everything. Look what he says in verse 3. And pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ because Jesus is so awesome. Like the plan and all that Jesus wants to do for you is so big and so awesome. He's saying, pray we'd have opportunities to speak. But look at this last line. And this is why I'm in chains. Whoa, Paul's in prison. He's scribing this thing from prison. And it's not playing checkers, watching TV. Come on, where are my jailhouse people at? It is not what we live in. Sitting there playing chess and watching Netflix series with our feet kicked up, eating taxpayer food. No, Paul's sitting in a dungeon with a hole about this big where light comes through and probably his feces and food right next to each other. He's sitting in prison scribing this out for preaching the gospel. Now, if you are sitting in prison and you're writing the church to be praying, what's the next thing you'd ask them to pray for? Anybody. Y'all aren't honest with me. Come on. I'll tell you what I'd, I'd tell them to pray for. Get me out of here! Anybody? <laughs> Please get me. Pray that I will get out of here. He's in there for preaching the gospel. He didn't do anything wrong. Get me out of here. Look what his prayer is, his next prayer request. Oh, oh, and by the way, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. What? Because he wants to reach every prisoner, every guard, everyone around him, anything that links to where he's at. I want the message to keep moving no matter where I'm at. He's living a life way bigger than he can control. Get me out of here. I have so much to accomplish. No, if I'm here, pray that I can say the message as clearly as possible. This is living a life bigger than yourself. This is living a life bigger than you can control. Notice he's not worried about getting out. He's praying, let me make a difference. Let me make a mark right here where I'm at. Pray that while I'm here, God does something in this situation. Some of y'all are trying to get out today. Some of y'all want out. Some of y'all are fighting for a change, fighting for a shift, and maybe it's not living a life I can control, but rather, God, have your way right where I'm at. See, Paul's living a life bigger than himself just with this statement. He's not worried about getting out. Here's my challenge. Live, living lives too small to pray about everything exhausts us. If we live lives so small that we're not praying about everything, let me just say it like this, the things you're not praying about are exhausting you. The things your hand are laid on that you're not praying about 
are wearing you out. If we live lives so small that we don't pray about everything because they're not big enough to talk to God about, it's wearing you out. The goal is to live a life so big, I got to pray about everything. You want to know what makes a life so big? It's not a bunch of stuff. It's not a position. It's not a promotion. It's that I pray about all of it. That's what makes a life big is that I pray about all of it. And so the things we're not praying about are the very things that exhaust us. Let me take a little bit and just show you some things on prayer that I just love. Jesus talks to us in Matthew 7. A few things about prayer. Many of you have heard this. But sometimes we don't understand prayer. Sometimes we don't understand what it is. Sometimes we think we're trying to make a God do something that doesn't want to do something. We're trying to twist his arm. And really, I like to say you're actually opening the door for him to move on the earth. Prayer is so important because the more things you pray about, the more doors you open to say, God, get here. God, show up here. God, have your way here. And we're actually access points to God moving in the earth. It's permission. Many of you might not know this, but God can't just show up on the earth and do what he wants. He needs people who will link up and say, God, I'm a vessel. Move through me. He needs bodies to move through. And so it's huge how we pray. Look, look what Jesus said. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Notice the keep on keeping on, right? Gotta keep swimming, right? Is that what it is? Just keep, keep swimming. Just keep praying, Nemo, right? Keep on asking and you will receive. Keep on seeking and you will find keep on knocking and the door will be open i like to think of this prayer as levels of intimacy these are levels of intimacy in prayer keep on asking and you will receive notice this that for everyone who asks receives notice the words ask receive for everyone who asks receives what this reminds me of, if any of you have kids in here before, to the point where they can start talking, when they can start talking, if you remember driving in the car, maybe you're going around town, you started to hear this little voice in the back going, what's that? What's that? What's that? Anyone remember that time in life? What's that? I remember when my kids, oh my goodness, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? It's like, it's a car, it's a house, it's a pasture, it's a cow, it's a sign. It's, sometimes you just wouldn't even know. It's a duck. What? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And I remember, I remember personally, I mean, it's just like, oh, I remember one time just being like, just be quiet. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, the only way they'll know is if they ask. And he began to reveal to me this, that you have the opportunity in life to set a foundation for what that is. What's that? What's that? Oh, that's a cop. You know what they do? They go around and ruin all of our fun and just want to pull us over when we're trying to get somewhere. They're the ones that just are trying. No, that's a police officer that protects us. And they're the ones that guard our community. And they're the ones that show up when we're in trouble. They're for us. That's what that is. And I realized that what's that? That asking What's that? What's that? Is the ability to learn the truth or give the truth. And there's a lot of stuff in your life that you've never said, God, what's that? What's that? You know what he's saying in this? Ask me about everything. Well, I already know. You might not. You might have a wrong foundation of what that is. What's that? He wants you asking him about everything, nonstop. What's this, Lord? What's this, Lord? How's this work, Lord? Why does it work like that, Lord? How do I do this, Lord? When do I do that, Lord? What's that? What's that? What's that? He wants you asking constantly. Every area of your life, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Ask and you'll receive because he can give you the truth about what that is. And then you'll know. There's a lot of things we're living on that aren't real foundations of that. And we need to ask him about everything. It's the first level of prayer. 
Ask me about everything. Don't have anything in your life that's going on that you're not asking him about, that you're not constantly bringing before him. Ask me about everything. The next one is this. Everyone who seeks finds. Notice you're looking for something and you're finding something. You're looking for something, you're seeking. Anyone ever looked for that other sock? Young generation never had that problem, y'all. They just used two different colors. We were like freaking out because we couldn't find the same one. That was a huge issue in our life, young people. Looking, seeking. Here's this. When I seek, when I seek, I'm looking for something. I'm looking for something deeper. It reminds me of the little kid that's seeking and he goes, Mom, 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 Dad, where's Mom? Right? That's usually what they need us for. <laughs> they are seeking for something. They, you're seeking. Seeking means I'm looking for something deeper than just what's that, what's that. I got to find it. I, I got to find it. I got to know what's your purpose for my life, Lord. I got to know why I'm here. I got to know why I'm go, where I'm going next. I got to know that there's more to this than what I see with my eyes. I got to know there's more to this battle than what I'm facing right now. I got to know there's something deeper than what I'm feeling in my being. I, I got to seek it. I got to find your wisdom. I got to find your plan. I got to find your purpose. I'm not going to just stand here. I'm going to seek it out. And when I seek, I find it. And I go, there it is. And it's treasure because I sought it. There's this place where we just, what's that? What's that? What's that? But then there's this level of intimacy where I go a little deeper with God and I start seeking stuff out. God, I want to know just a little more about your heart. I want to know just a little more about what you're doing in the earth. I got to know a little more about this situation right here. I'm going to seek it out. I'm not just going to ask. I'm, I'm digging into this thing, Lord. I'm finding the answer here. It's this other level of intimacy where when I seek God, when I seek his purpose, when I seek his wisdom, I find it. Have you ever experienced that before? It's treasure. You know what you usually find is him with the answer. I seek it out. Yes, that's what it is. Don't you love when the light bulb just clicks and it's like, oh, that's it. You ever had that moment? I just, I love something you've been seeking on and thinking on and all of a sudden it's just like, bing, you found it. You found it because you were seeking him for it. These are levels of intimacy. Ask me about everything. Don't let anything be going on in your life you're not asking him about. But then have these areas of your life where you're putting the plow down. You are seeking it out. And then the next one, is anyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You ever had to get into somebody's house or make sure somebody was home? You ever been looking for somebody at the house and you, it's that, hey, are you in there? Come on. You ever had that situation? Maybe not knowing if someone's alive or not. That's scary. I've done that. I've had to do that before. Like, are you in there? Are you, I mean, you are, just answer the door. You're knocking, you're knocking. Why? Because you're looking for somebody. You don't knock on a door if you're not looking for somebody. You don't knock on a door looking for something. You knock on a door looking for somebody. Anywhere you see this in the scriptures, it's intimacy. Knocking is intimacy. It's, listen, it's I want you. This level of intimacy is where I want more than your hand, God. I don't want what's in your hand only. I want what's in your heart. I got to know you. I got to know you. I need you to answer the door. I need time with you. God, I want to know your heart. This is that place, parents, where your kids become kind of adults and you begin to have mature conversations about vision and life and purpose and the conversation becomes back and forth, giving and taking. It's this place of intimacy where now I'm not just trying to get something from you. I'm not just looking for what's in your hand. I've got to get you, Lord. I want to know you. And the scriptures talk about when I knock, the door will be opened and I will dine with him. I'll have intimacy with God. See, there's levels of intimacy in this where I ask God about everything. There's nothing going on in my life that I'm not asking him for 
or about. There's places where I'm seeking wisdom. I gotta know your heart on this, Lord. What are you saying about it? And then there's these areas of prayer in my life where I'm knocking on the door because, Lord, I need to know you. I gotta know you. And this is praying about everything. It's praying about everything so that you can worry about nothing. See, it's a command for rest that God's given us today. He's called us to live lives so big and so on purpose, so much passion that God is first. God is first in all of it. Lord, I put you first in all of it. This is why we invite you to Saturday morning prayer. We do Saturday morning prayer from 8 to 9 a.m., and we call it pray first. Pray first. It's a culture that we believe is so important. If you don't want to live lives of worry, be in prayer. Be in prayer. And it's just one place where we start and say, come with us. Join us in prayer. Pray first. Pray before action. That's the culture of it. That's the point of it. Before you make any act, pray. Before you send that email, before you send that text, before you go to that interview, before you go on that blind date, before it's going to be a scene date, you better pray first. Pray first. Pray first. Pray first. And we love this opportunity Saturday mornings to lay everything on the table and pray first. We'd love for you to join us in that. Be a part of praying first. Pray before action. So important. Corey Tinboom said it like this, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? That's a great question. Is prayer your steering wheel? Does it direct your life? What's that? What's that? What's that? Is it always up in prayer? Are you always leading it? Or is it always going before you? Is it my steering wheel? Does it direct my life and my decisions? Or is it that thing in the back that when an emergency happens, I guess we better pray. Well, has it come to that, brother? <laughs> That's funny, right? Like, is it last resort or first response? Is it last resort or the first thing we do? Because it directs our life. Because we don't live lives of worry. We live lives of prayer. We get to pray. Think about this. We get to talk to the one who has all the answers. I know you have someone in your life that thinks they have all the answers, but no, we actually get to talk to the one who has all the answers. Sometimes I think about that and think, why wouldn't we show up with an absolute list of questions? Prayer should be the most exciting thing we do. And then, and then, and then, right? It's like you have all the answers. We get to do this. And so... The command of rest today, I want to show you this because how do we live a life where our anythings and everythings are up in prayer? At the end of the command that we got to pray about everything is this scripture that gives us so much hope and so much purpose in living lives bigger than we can control. Living a life so big, God has to control it. And look at this promise. Notice the then. This is the, the, the next part of the scripture we started with, of our command. Then, I like to say then and only then. After you pray about everything rather than worrying about everything, then you will experience God's peace. Anyone need that today? You'll experience God's peace. Notice it's not the world's peace, it's God's peace, which it's, exceeds anything you can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your mind, notice this, as you live in Christ Jesus, live in a life bigger than I can control. This scripture is the greatest promise I believe in the Bible. When you experience God's peace, it exceeds anything you can understand. You know what that means? That when you shouldn't have peace, you have it. When something goes on and it doesn't make any sense, and it's like, I should not have peace right now, and for some reason I do. There's no reason, it makes no sense why I have peace but I have it. When you pray about everything, you have peace in it. If you don't pray about it, there's no peace, so all you have is worry. And what God's saying is anything that you'll bring to me, anything that you'll pray about will have a response of peace over that situation. If you're worried about it, it's because you didn't pray about it, and therefore there's no peace. 
about it. If we pray about it, there's peace and it guards my heart and it guards my mind as I walk through it. Because praying about it doesn't mean the answer shows up. It means I've laid it over to the Lord and what he gives me back is not always an answer right away. Peace until the answer. Peace. I can live with peace that guards my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. This peace, it's so powerful. We're called to live in it. Do you know why God can actually, as a good father, throw out the command, don't worry about anything? Because he expects us to have peace about everything. Because we're praying about everything. Church, it's the greatest exchange in life. You either keep it and get worry, or you exchange it and get peace. See, we've turned it religious. We've made it something we have to do. Well, I guess I have to pray. No, we get to pray. I, I get the greatest exchange ever. Here's my prayer. Here's peace. Our command today is that we would be these people where we could actually say, I'm worried about nothing because I pray about everything. Wouldn't you love that? Wouldn't you love that being a realization? Wouldn't you love that being your testimony? Wouldn't you love being able to give that away to the world around you who is freaking out right now? We can have it. We can have it, but the command goes with it. I am worried about nothing because I'm praying about everything. Ask, seek, and knock, and the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind. It's who we are. Church, this is rested. This is a rested people. We Sabbath. We're rested because we Sabbath. We trust God in it. We trust him with our first. We give God our first, and we're rested. We refuse revenge because it doesn't belong to us. And we pray about everything. And we are rested people, strengthened to do his work. Amen? Are you ready to be rested? Can I pray with you today? Let it take root. Let it live in you. Let it come through you. Lord, I'm so thankful for the people that you've brought here today, your precious sons and daughters. I'm thankful that you're building your church right now in this hour and that we have an opportunity to be a part of it. And I'm thankful, God, for the rested revelation in your word that you've called us to be rested. And I pray that these topics and commands and understandings would root deep within us and bear fruit. I pray that we would be arrested people away from the chaos of the world, but be able to reach a chaotic world, be able to help a hurting world, be light in the darkness because we're rested, because we're not caught up, we're able to show up and make a difference. Lord, we're trusting you, we love you, and we say let it root in us and bear fruit in us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And I just want to pray for anyone in this room today. Maybe you have realized how much your life matters and you're starting to feel the value of, man, I'm more important than I thought. And you're hearing that. God wants to use me. And when you realize your life matters and when you realize the value on your life, the greatest thing you can do is give it back to him. If I could say it plainly, your life is too valuable for you to handle. It actually needs to go back into his hands. Because we mess it up. And I want to be able to pray with you today and give you the opportunity to come back to the Lord. The Bible says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, you are Lord, which means I give you my life, work in me. And then it says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you can be saved, which means delivered from hell, protected, freedom. All of these things are in that opportunity. And I want to give you that opportunity today. If you've never made him the Lord of your life today, I'd love to pray with you. And I'm just going to have you pray that specific prayer with me of confessing him as Lord, believing in your heart today, and coming back to him, 
So if you've never done that before, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. If you want to give your life to him today, it's the best decision you can ever make. It is the greatest miracle in all the Bible. So church, I'm going to have you pray with me. And if, if you're doing this for the first time today, pray with sincerity. Position yourself before God. Give him your life because it's so valuable. Would you pray this with me? Say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life today. I ask you to forgive me for any sin. And I confess that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead so that I could be saved. I ask you to take my life and use it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. The, the Bible actually says the angels are rejoicing in heaven, and there's no party like a heaven party. Come on, somebody.